Let me introduce this fantastic panel. Um, sitting next to me is uh, my friend Jeff Nyman, from all the way from Fort Lauderdale, where it's much warmer. Much, much, much. And uh, Jeff is with the firm of Marcus Nyman and Rashbaum. Jeff is an accomplished trial attorney. He focuses on white collar defense, tax controversies, securities regulatory matters, and general litigation. He graduated with honors from the University of Florida. He uh, went uh, to the United States Attorney's Office, the United States uh, Justice, uh, I'm sorry, the United States Department of Justice. Uh, office and um, he rece received the General's Honors Program there. For nine years he worked as an AUSA and a trial attorney for the Department of Justice in South Florida and in Washington DC. Jeff is recognized nationally for handling uh, complex high-profile matters including and most especially the groundbreaking and historic prosecution of Switzerland's largest bank UBS AG for aiding American citizens to commit tax fraud. Jeff is a frequent lecturer and panelist. He's a contributor at conferences on topics including offshore tax evasion, tax fraud, Ponzi schemes, and trial practice. And Jeff is going to contribute to this panel specifically and uh, not exclusively though regarding the tax uh, implications. Uh, of Bitcoin, use of Bitcoin. He is uh, a recipient of the Attorney General's John Marshall Award for Outstanding Legal Achievement, which is the highest award offered to an attorney for a contribution in a specialized area of legal performance by the United States Attorney General. Equally impressive sitting next to Jeff is Frederick Reynolds who is the Deputy Director of the Department of Treasury Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, fondly referred to as FinCEN. Fred was appointed uh, as the Deputy Director at FinCEN uh, on January 13, 2013. Frederick oversees FinCEN's wide-ranging work to protect the United States financial system from money laundering and other forms of illicit financial activity and to advance the national security interests of the United States. <clears throat> well, I don't need to tell you how Frederick fits into this panel, but I do want to. <laughs> <laughs> FinCEN leads the development of regulatory policy to combat money laundering and terrorist financing and is a respected leader among the world's financial intelligence units. Frederick joined the Treasury Department from the Department of Justice, where he most recently served as Deputy Chief in the Criminal Division. While at the Department of Justice, Mr. Reynolds founded and headed the Forfeiture Unit for the Asset Forfeiture and Money Laundering Section. During his tenure as Deputy Chief, the unit was responsible for seizures and forfeitures totaling more than $1 billion. Prior to serving as Deputy Chief in the Criminal Division, Frederick served as a senior trial attorney in the Department of Justice. Prior to joining the Department of Justice, Frederick served as an attorney, Assistant Attorney General for the Republic of Palau, where he founded and headed the country's first financial intelligence unit. That a lot. <laughs> And following law school, Frederick joined the Winstead Law Firm in Dallas, Texas. He was an associate and a senior associate there in private practice. He specialized in complex civil litigation, securities, and antitrust law. He holds a BA cum laude from Brandeis and a JD from Emory. And Frederick is a member of the State Bar of Texas which had a recent decision regarding whether or not Bitcoin is money. So we'll get to that later. It's in the state of Texas. Sitting next to Frederick is Margo H.K. Tank. Margo hails to us from Washington, D.C., where it is certainly warmer than it is here. Not by all that much, but warmer. 
Margo just flew in. She's a, a true panelist trooper. She landed not less than an hour and a half ago. Margo is a partner at Buckley Sander, Sandler. Margo advises financial services institutions and technology companies on structuring online and mobile financial services product offerings in compliance with the Electronic Signatures in Global and National Commerce Act and the Uniform Electronic Transactions Act, as well as with respect to state and federal laws governing electronic financial services transactions, which of course includes prepaid access and virtual payment methods. Margo is truly an expert in virtual payment methods. Her other activities include acting as co-reporter for the drafting committee preparing the standards and procedures for electronic records. Uh, she is an advocate before Congress and federal regulators with respect to electronic financial services issues. She was named in 2009 the Mortgage Banking Technology All-Star by Mortgage Banking Magazine. She's a member of the ABA's Business Law Section, the Committee on the Law of Commerce and Cyberspace, and the Electronic Transaction Association's Mobile Payments Committee. Prior to joining Buckley Sander, Sandler, Margo was with Goodwin Proctor. And before entering private practice, she was counsel to the U.S. House of Representatives, the Committee on Banking and Finance Services. <coughs> she received her JD from Drake University with honors. And she uh, received her BA from the University of Vermont, and she also studied in Oxford in England. And Margot has written numerous publications. Uh, I would urge you to take a look at some of her uh, pieces, because they're incredibly informative on this subject. And last, but certainly not least, is Mr. Luke Sully, who is the Director for Intelligence and the co-head of PwC's Digital Currency Task Force. Luke uh, advises clients on the impact of global threats to business and assets in implementing legal practices to detect, investigate, and remediate such issues. He has led a number of strategic intelligence assignments, collecting and analyzing risk-relevant information for his clients, usually in emerging markets. His clients include Fortune 50 companies, multilateral institutions, and governmental bodies. At PwC, he leads the development of the firm's strategic intelligence methodologies, and also has led multiple engagements to chart asset flows into high-risk jurisdictions such as Iran and Afghanistan. Previously, Luke worked in di public diplomacy for the British government in Latin America and for boutique risk consulting houses in Asia and Europe. He holds a first-class honors degree in languages and was a member of the Sloan School of Management's entrepreneur program at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. My name is Nina Marino. I'm a partner with the firm of Kaplan Marino in Beverly Hills. I specialize in white collar criminal defense practice. I will be your moderator. So to kick off this panel discussion, let me read to you what Ms. Raman said speaking in front of the United States Senate Committee in November. She is the Acting Assistant Attorney General for the U.S. Department of Justice's Criminal Division. And she said, and I quote, the Department of Justice recognizes that many virtual currency systems offer legitimate financial services and have the potential to promote more efficient global commerce. We have also seen however, that certain aspects of virtual currencies appeal to criminals and present a host of new challenges 
to law enforcement. And so with that, Margo, if I could ask you, set the table for us. Tell us what are we talking about when we're talking about Bitcoin? Sure. <clears throat> Virtual currency, digital currency, cryptocurrency, you know, what is it? Is it legal? Who regulates it? Um, we'll talk about all of that. Uh, some of the risks for payment processors, banks, merchants, consumers, investors, those uh, in the chain, uh, the, the legal actors. Um, these new and emerging payment forms vary. We're going to talk about all the different, from e-gold to Bitcoin and some of the differences. Uh, but they share a common feature. They're not legal tender, nor are they backed by any government, nor is the supply determined by a central bank. And those three factors are important because the government is having difficulty in defining what virtual currency is and how to regulate it because it doesn't meet traditional definitions. It's not currency by definition. Um, and we'll talk more about that, and, and Frederick can talk about what FinCEN has done to kind of address that definitional uh, issue. The appeal and drawbacks of virtual currencies are basically two sides of the virtual coin. Virtual currencies offer a level of anonymity and finality similar to cash and speed similar to credit cards. They can be transferred internationally with a click of a button. Except for cash, most payment systems require a middleman to move funds from buyers from a buyer's account to a seller's account. But by contrast, and in particular with Bitcoins, buyers and sellers may deal directly with each other to move the virtual currency. Many of these currencies have not yet seen widespread usage. Uh, they're not easy to exchange or exchange from fiat to virtual and back uh, legally anyway. Um, however, there are, according to coinmap.org, 2,600 stores and businesses worldwide now accepting Bitcoins with concentrations in Western Europe, California, and New York. So that adds another whole element when you can begin to purchase goods and services and then perhaps uh, resell the goods and services and we'll talk more about, more about that. Banks generally are not accepting or offering uh, services for them. Uh, there are concerns that cryptocurrencies are extremely risky due to volatility, but investors seem to like that concern and are rushing to the table to participate in any way they can. Um, regulators in several countries have warned against their use. Some have taken concrete regulatory action. Um, in our country, it's been a little bit more measured, saying that there could be some good purpose uh, for this uh, alternative payment um, system. The more anonymous the currency is, the more attractive it is to criminals, uh, regardless of the intention of its creators. So I'm sure that you've read um, over the past year or so, you know, snippets here and there, um, e-gold, web money, um, Second Life, maybe some of your children p play video games, uh, World of Warcraft, um, Liberty Reserve, uh, Bitcoins, and so on. They're all different types of, of virtual currency that has value that's either bought, mined, or earned. Uh, both state and federal regulators have taken a keen interest, and I think we'll, um, we'll talk about the the interest in particular, uh, Justice in FinCEN has taken, uh, most regulators agree that, again, that they're not illegal. The critical issue is going to be how, how do we regulate? How do we move, how does the government move in, either at the state level by requiring money transmitter licenses for these uh, entities, um, and certainly the, the federal government has its um, FinCEN registration for MSBs and its money laundering tools. But I'll, I'll turn it to you, Frederick, Frederick yeah. to, uh, yeah, and let me let me just just point the question, Margo. You say, how do we regulate? And maybe the broader question is, should we regulate? Is it is that really the power of the government to regulate? Because foundationally, the principle of Bitcoin was that it should not be regulated uh, because it's a mathematical series of calculations. 
that create this, this cryptocurrency. And so what business is it of the government? Frederick? So, so I think it's important to start from the concept that we, <laughs> we, we actually don't regulate Bitcoin. And I think that's a common misperception that FinCEN has regulated Bitcoin or has regulated any other cryptocurrency. Um, what we actually regulate are um, the individuals or businesses who fall within our regulations as money transmitters. And I, and I think that's an important distinction because if, if you have Bitcoin and you're going to go purchase a pair of shoes, um, we don't regulate that transaction. We don't have any visibility into that transaction. Um, you are a user under our regulations, and so you fall completely outside of our regulation whatsoever. Where we regulate is where we already have regulated for years, which is if you are somebody who moves something of value, okay, so if you're an MSB, um, whether you are Western Union, who's moving money from New York to Florida for somebody, or New York to Moscow, um, or whether you are a Bitcoin exchanger who is transferring Bitcoin from uh, Bitcoin to fiat currency or taking fiat currency and giving Bitcoin, or you're moving Bitcoin on behalf of someone else or any other virtual currency. That's really where we regulate. So it's this node point with uh, the sort of mainstream financial system um, and those are the points that we have typically regulated. And our guidance actually was not new regulation. What our guidance was, in essence, is letting virtual currency exchangers um, understand that they are covered by our existing guidance because they are MSBs. I, I just hear you say the word regulate, and as the criminal defense lawyer, I, I, I get nervous that there's a distinction between regulating and prosecuting. And what we have seen, though, now is the U.S. government prosecuting individuals for intentionally, is what the government would say, not complying with the FinCEN reporting requirements or the money transmitter registration, which along with the money transmitter registration comes a whole host of compliance issues and knowing your customer and due diligence. And it kind of is defeating what is the purpose of these currencies, which were created by folks who didn't want to deal with government regulation, I guess. And, and you have a few bad apples, I think, who are out there using this currency in a way to maybe deal, deal in drugs or prostitutions or even see a murder for hire with, 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 with these virtual currencies that are done. I guess that's kind of got to be the question that, that, that we have to ask Vincent is, where are you guys going? How far is, is this regulation versus prosecution? So, so first of all, I mean, I think it's a, it's a distinction that that obviously, you know, having worked at the department, and I know, is that the Department of Justice ultimately is the prosecution authority, and they make prosecution decisions. Now, the Congress has passed laws that impose criminal penalties at times uh, for criminal violations of a regulatory scheme, and that exists whether you're in banking, securities, um, or in the MSB field. And I think the fundamental concept that Congress has put forth is that um, it is, it is a privilege to participate as an entity in the financial system, and, and with that comes certain responsibilities. And those responsibilities, again, whether you're a bank, whether you're a securities broker dealer, um, there are certain responsibilities that come with that. And uh, one of them is registration with FinCEN if you're an MSB, and there are certain program requirements that attach to that as well. Uh, again, if you're a user, None of this is directly applicable to you. It's only if you are an exchanger or falling under the category of an MSB um, that our regulations impact you at all. I think the, the, the challenge that a lot of the industry is facing is that you're absolutely right. The, the MSB regulation is very clear and, and the US government have been consistent throughout. But the issue is, is that the burden, the responsibility for monitoring suspicious activity is placed on the money services businesses. And this is a new realm because you're looking at essentially anonymous transactions across the internet that aren't necessarily linked to an individual, they're linked to an IP address. And so I think it's, it's proving very, very challenging for companies who want to be compliant, yet at the same time know there's an incredible amount of uncertainty about how you go about um, not, not registering, but your re reporting requirements and your record keeping is an extremely tough ask. And that is a a gap that we're seeing right now. It's not just a tough ask act. I think it's a, a virtually impossible 
task for a lot of these <laughs> for for a lot of these Vir virtually or digitally impossible. Yeah, yeah I, Be because because we, we were talking earlier, you go into a bank and you deal with a cash transaction, or maybe th th there's something that just raises some suspicions face to face in the bank. The bank files a su suspicious activity report. How does one of these transmitters deal with that? Well, you can have... How can they? When you set up an account, you give all of your identifier information, which is fine. That's all stored. But really, it's an IP address and a public key that are the two identifier pieces of information. And linking an IP address, as anyone who works in cybercrime <laughs> knows, is extremely difficult to under understand the, uh, the underlying um, individual responsible for an IP address. And so that's the gap. And that's holding up the development of the but industry. I think. If you bring these actors into the registration system, whether it be federal or state, <clears throat> then there's requirements to take identifying information oh, yeah. and requirements to build uh, flags for tracking suspicious and unusual activity. The problem is that, that everyone's playing outside of that. Yeah. So, of course, they're not going to collect, they don't want to collect, but there are mechanisms that could be utilized to, so, to collect identifying I agree. You know, but I, think, I think the way the industry's developed in the last six months is that there is the underlying exchanges that will convert fiat for Bitcoin and vice versa. But there's, there's another raft on top of that of companies that sit on top of exchanges that don't want the, the headache and the, and the criminal liability if something goes wrong. And so that broad band of technology and industry and brokers mm -hmm. is building and it's turning into sort of a bulge right now. But it, and that's creating more, more business and more business opportunities, but the underlying regulatory issue with respect to exchanges still hasn't changed, I guess. So, I mean, one of the, the issues that, um, that I, I think the, the everyone's dealing with right now is whether or not Bitcoin is, in fact, legal tender, is it not? I mean, you raised that right at the outset, right, Margo. Right. And um, a, a court in Texas recently ruled on that. Can you explain a little bit about that? That decision, and either well, maybe the man from Texas should explain. <laughs> I'll, I'll, the the Texas court basically found that the SEC could pursue an individual for misrepresentations related to Bitcoin investments mm -hmm. because the um, investment was an investment contract, which is a contract involving an investment of money. So not so again when we start out we talk about currency. If you look it up, it's government backed. Money can be not government backed, can be other things. So the SEC in this case said it's, it's money. Um, you want to add to that? So, so I think you know, the, the government position has been fairly clear that it, it is a medium of exchange or value. Um, it, it can store value, it is a medium of exchange, but it is not a fiat currency. And that's defined by federal law as to what is a fiat currency. Um, and to my knowledge, unless it's changed recently, it is not considered a fiat currency in any country throughout the world. So, so at this stage, uh, Bitcoin, and, and I'm unaware of any other virtual currency, which has been considered a fiat currency, again, I think that's an important distinction that just because it's not a fiat currency doesn't mean it is not uh, a thing of value. It doesn't mean it can't store value. It doesn't mean it is not a means of transmitting value, which is exactly why it gets pulled under our MSB regulations. Mm -hmm. And I think the government's been, to, to its credit, has been clever. And you even hear from the acting assistant attorney general's comments where she kind of talks on both sides a little bit how there's legitimate purposes here, but there's also the, the, the illicit purpose that, that gives them the concern where they've taken the existing laws on the books, the existing money laundering laws, the existing money transmitter laws, mail wire fraud, if, there, if there's a scheme to defraud there, and have used them and applied them in, in these virtual currency worlds where the courts have taken the view that although it doesn't explicitly say that these currencies or these types of schemes fall within the, the, the thoughts of, of, of the code, that they still apply. And, and, right. and, and, and to me, that's, you know, that's kind of fundamental good government, right, is, is at the end of the day, you actually want to draft, and I've, you know, we have a regulatory attorney who can talk about this, I'm sure, much more eloquently than I can, but I mean, at the end of the day, I think you want to draft regulations uh, laws certainly, but I think regulations importantly, that will stand the test of time. Because if every time there's a new technology or every time there's an innovation, uh, FinCEN has to go in and tweak a regulation um, 
to make it applicable or to deal with it, uh, that's not, in my opinion, a very good regulation. And that's one of the things I think is, is important about the way we have drafted our uh, regulations in our space is we have drafted them in a way that they are flexible enough to account for innovation. And frankly, I think they're flexible enough to allow innovation. And I think that's one of the important things to realize is that um, you know, there's been, there's been no attempt by the U.S. government to stop innovation or stop Bitcoin. What we've done is just used existing regulations that have applied to a wide variety of things, not just virtual currency, um, and use them so that we can keep pace with technology to ensure that the, that the technology is not used for illicit purposes, um, but by the same token, allowing uh, innovation in this space. But, but that's always the concern. Is, is the government regulation and the government enforcement going to suffocate that innovation? Is it going to prevent those who want to participate in this mechanism from, from, from doing so? I think it goes both ways. I mean, we get calls where companies who want to be Bitcoin exchangers, they don't like the state regime. It's ex expensive, time-consuming, a lot to manage. And they say, well, geez, can't we be regulated by CFTC or SEC or somebody? Can somebody tell us what to do? So, you know, there's, the, you know, the good guys do want to get in the game and have some safe, I'm not going to call it safe harbor, but some place where Protection. they know if they play by the rules that they're going to be fine. I, I think, though, that assets not seized. You know. One thing I would say is I think the, the clock is, is ticking. Um, in as much as that the gap between technological innovation and, and regulatory standards is still there. And unless that gap is filled, um, although the regulators don't want to stifle innovation, um, there is a finite amount of time before a, another jurisdiction mm -hmm. decides to move ahead on this with lower regulatory standards and the industry will move there. So um, and we've seen it now for We've seen it brewing for probably six to eight months. And, I, and I, I think we don't have very much time left, frankly, for the industry to pony up, frankly. Um, or this will, this could, and which is, comes back to the point, I think, of our talk, um, this could either dive and become the um, uh, method of exchange of choice for, for bad actors or could just move offshore completely. And that is one of the, I don't want to sound overly uh, melodramatic, but it, it, it could prove a doomsday scenario for the US government if, that, if the entire industry and exchanger community moves offshore. Um, you know, FinCEN regulation is there to protect the United States from bad actors placing money through the financial system. Um, but it's even more difficult when that entire industry is offshore. And, and haven't uh, foreign jurisdictions uh integrated, there are some foreign jurisdictions, I could be mistaken, but that have integrated Bitcoin into their banking system already. Uh, there's so, been very uneven um, regulatory standards around the world. Um, if, you, if you look at China, um, China mm -hmm. liked it, and then December they decided they didn't like it. And there, may, may, there, there could be many reasons why they decided to do that. Um, uh, Germany classified it as private money, though mm -hmm. I haven't really understood what that means. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know what that means. Well, if you don't know what that means, yeah, well, you're lost. Um, so, so there is uneven, there's uneven regulatory standards. I think that um, FATF regulation seems to be the, the ultimate global driver right now. Um, but we, we, what you're seeing is a safe haven in Canada. Um, and... Um, you know, just, just, just north of here, and very close to here. So I, I think that's an interesting, the, the pattern of regulatory development globally um, will be an interesting one to watch. Well, I'm not taking as legal fees yet Bitcoins, and I'm not sure I, I ever will get to that point, but I guess I, I think we kind of can substitute, it doesn't matter what the currency, virtual currency we're talking about is, I think the government's kind of approaching this in the same way they would whether you're dealing in, with cash, mm -hmm. in, in, in that they're, are certain regulations in which everyone has to, and laws that people have to comply with if they deal in cash, and, and they're taking the concept of of kind of willful blindness or or, 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 or put it, those who are dealing in bitcoins or virtual currencies just like they do with cash in money laundering cases and saying, look, you should know that this is bad money, and the fact that you're moving this means that you're guilty of a crime. And just last week, I guess we saw one of the. The, the founders of, of Bitcoin get, get indicted in the Southern District of New York and, and charged with basically allowing this black market on his watch 
go on w w with illegal activity, which I think is raising a whole other host of issues as to how is the government going to prove the intent here uh, of, of these individuals who knew that the system which is designed to be secret and underground and, and, and fuzzy to, 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 to deal with knew that there was illegal activity going on under his watch, so to speak. And you're referring to the Charlie Shrem arrest, and which, which raises a very interesting issue. Uh, in light of, of that arrest, can, do we conclude that federal prosecutors are ramping up efforts to crack down on online exchanges where Bitcoin is the currency of choice? Well, there's federal prosecutors and there's the Southern District of New York, so I don't know if we <laughs> want to necessarily... Uh, <laughs> Well, and, and, and look, I, I think it's tough any time, you know, being a former federal prosecutor, I think it's mm -hmm. tough any time to draw sweeping generalizations from any particular case because a case is just that, right? A case relates to a specific criminal activity and, and I don't have any specialized knowledge uh, of the Shrem case and so I would let my colleagues from SDNY talk about their case. But, you know, I think more generically, um, it, it's important to realize that this is not sort of a theoretical risk, right? Um, we've seen Liberty Reserve, which was a virtual currency and was to date uh, the largest money laundering case in U.S. history. Um, you've seen uh, Silk Road, which exclusively used Bitcoin uh, as its means of exchange, specifically because Bitcoin uh, was perceived to be anonymous. Um, and was perceived to be the currency of choice. So it's not a theoretical risk that I think these currencies pose. We've actually seen a number of cases uh, that have been charged. Uh, FinCEN obviously participated in the Liberty Reserve using our Section 311 power to mm -hmm. designate Liberty Reserve mm -hmm. as a primary money laundering mm -hmm. concern. Um, and I think that goes to Luke's point of, you know, if it does go offshore, what ability do we have? I don't disagree it becomes more difficult. So there's no question about that. But you know, the U.S. government does still have tools at its disposal um, if, it, if there is a threat offshore, such as Liberty Reserve, there are tools that we have um, to try to address that threat to the U.S. financial system. And let's look at those tools for a second, because the, when you say 311, 311, you're talking about the Patriot Act. Mm -hmm. so. so Section 311 of the Patriot Act um, allows FinCEN, uh, the Department of Treasury more broadly, but delegated down to FinCEN, to designate um, a foreign, uh, typically business, uh, usually a financial institution, um, as what we call a primary money laundering concern. Um, and there's a variety of things that can be done uh, as part of that. It could be simply uh, increased reporting uh, on the entity. Uh, it could be all the way up to uh, barring that entity or jurisdiction from interacting with the U.S. financial system. Uh, so it's essentially a way to regulate uh, who has access to the U.S. financial system if there has been a determination uh, that it is uh, a primary money loan concern. And that in and of itself is actually a regulatory action. So we, uh, we actually uh, put in front of OMB uh, proposed regulations that designate um, an entity or a jurisdiction as a primary money laundering concern. So that's certainly something we have sort of facing out from the United States. Uh, then, of course, internally we have, uh, again, I think, as Jeff mentioned, really the, the typical powers that we exercise both in the virtual space as well as not in the virtual space is, is we have uh, civil regulatory authority and then, of course, the Department of Justice, uh, again, I think uses the tools that it has always used um, to deal with these. Margo mentioned a, a question to me before we started about uh, couldn't people use Bitcoin to purchase, uh, purchase goods and then sell those goods and get real cash for them? And, and I said, yeah, absolutely. That's you know, trade-based money laundering, which goes on every day uh, and goes on in a variety of currencies. And so I think at times, you know, Bitcoin and virtual currencies, we hear cryptocurrencies, right. and it seems you know, very innovative and very interesting, and it's sort of the latest thing. But at the end of the day, um, not to not to de-emphasize the interest of, of yeah, the come panel. Come on, we gotta get some panel here. Yeah. Yeah, it's, like, it's great, but but I think it's important to remember that um, just because you use a virtual currency as opposed to cash, it doesn't suddenly make something which is trade-based money laundering that we've seen for 30 years. Uh, it, it doesn't make it go away, or it doesn't make it 
candidly any more interesting. It's sort of the same thing, and we have the same tools to deal with it. Yeah, I, I think we've seen a, a U.S. government war on the use of cash, uh, and they want to make it as comfortable, uncomfortable, and as difficult for it's for American citizens to deal in cash because the government wants to come back and be able to track every purchase and every move and where you were and where you drove and, Google and, and, and Google, yeah, if not, <laughs> well, the, Google and the U.S. government, we don't know what the, the line's been blurred between the two of them lately. <laughs> it, it, it seems where you, you just have to wonder, this just is just the next phase, is that now they want to put the war on the, uh, on the virtual currencies as well to make that just as uncomfortable and impossible to deal with, where basically we're stuck in a world where we're going to be watched and, and have every move, move looked at. Yeah, look, I'm not surprised that something like this has occurred. And, 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 uh, and if you, tr you track it back to e-gold and it closed peer-to-peer -peer ways of paying each other, this does break out of that mold, I think. But, you know, 85% of the world's transactions are still in cash. And if you speak to the, the CEO of credit card companies, you know, there's a big market out there that they want to capture. Um, and, and, and I do think, you know, for regulatory purposes, um, you, you know, the U.S. government need to, ident need to f be able to track the movements of money. And so th there is a push towards a cashless economy, and it's been slowly, slowly moving there. Um, but this is another step in that direction. So in some respects, you can't stifle that innovation for lots of reasons. Um, so th we're seeing a trend away from cash without a doubt. Um, but what you have to do is not find that very fine balance between ensuring that, that the regulatory agencies can still be able to understand what that movement looks like at the same time as developing the innovation. That's the balance that I, I'm glad I'd not paid to try and figure out on a day-to-day -day basis, because that's tough. I just think people are always going to buy drugs. People are always going to uh, engage in, 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 in want to hire hitmen and pay cash for, or pay for. Like there's always going to be bad acts, and and, and I guess you just want to hope that the, when the government comes in and looks at these cases from 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 the criminal perspective, that they're not going to put such pressure on on those who are are in in these these transmitters to make it go away completely that, that we're, we're, we're out of luck. And, and well, or so not the drug dealers and the hitmen are out of luck, but, but just that those who want to do legitimate currency, commerce through this currency are out of luck. So I think it circles back to the point we started with, which is at the end of the day, whether you're going and paying $200 in cash or you're paying $200 in Bitcoin um, for a product, the reality is, is we have no more visibility into the cash than we do to the Bitcoin. Yeah, I'd like um, you to comment on that too, Margo, because we had talked about that earlier. Um, does, does, does the existence of Bitcoin really make it easier to commit a crime? Right? I, I think mm. the, the differentiator, if we had to find one, would be the ability to sit at home um, in your slippers and push a button and send Bitcoins to China versus taking the cash and you know moving it, putting it in a car and going across the border. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just mm -hmm. easier mm -hmm. to do. So those who are trying to do it more easily, yeah. faster, cheaper, and not get caught may go to the electronic version of it. Yeah, I think, look, I, I, I think you can't ignore the anonymous nature of Bitcoin and the ease um, that it can be moved. If you look at the Secretary of Treasury's comments in Davos, you know he was very clear that mm -hmm. um, it's important for the Treasury Department to uh, look at how virtual currencies can be abused and to ensure that they do not become the favorite medium of exchange for criminal activity, terrorism, um, and that it, its anonymous nature is obviously something that lends itself to that as well as the ability to move it quickly. Um, but I also think that, you know, the Secretary was measured in his comments. Um, he certainly didn't say that there was anything inherently wrong with virtual currency. He didn't say that there was, um, you know, at the end of the day, there was, there was no war on cash, there was no war on Bitcoin. Um, it, it merely is a concern, like we have a concern with any payment system and with any part of the financial industry, to harden it, to protect it against abuse by criminals and terrorists, and, and that's that's our mission. And protect consumers, and, and protect investors, and, yeah. and protect stability right. of the whole system right. and valuation. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, you know, that might may lead well into um, a really nice example of the use of Bitcoin in a criminal enterprise. And um, so there's a, a very nice USA Today uh, slideshow 
And we'll talk through this a little bit. But I, what, I, what I want us to, to consider, um, what the, I want the panel to consider is, what are we really talking about here? Are we talking about Bitcoin as being the, the root of the evil? Or are we talking about really the dark net yeah. being the root of the evil? I mean, mm -hmm. where is, where is the, the criminal connection? So, Jeff, you want to, this is the, the first slide. Yeah, yeah sure. Look, well, the USA Today always does a great job of simplifying things for us. <laughs> <laughs> In color with really fancy graphics, <laughs> which really speak for themselves to a large part. But basically what you have here is this, this Silk Road 101, which kind of takes on the first slide what a normal network, how a normal network works, where you have a user makes a purchase from a merchant and it goes through a server and it's kind of transparent. For, 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 the, for the world to see. But, but what you see though is in the next slide is that Silk Road, which was one of these, um, um, uh, what the government calls a black market that um, allowed the Bitcoins to be traded on or used to be used as a server here, you use some, some technology to kind of code everything a little bit in disguise and make it even more difficult for, and by the way, I'll feel free to chime in with this. Especially you, Luke, because yeah. you know this stuff, Cole. Uh, <laughs> not personally, I just... <laughs> you, you haven't I purchased like with think. Bitcoin? Yeah. Has anyone ever actually purchased with Bitcoin? I'm just Because you, you see kind of retailers that, that try and have been out there saying that they're going to do it and then they back away from doing it. Yeah. I, I don't know. Um, Sacramento Kings, Overstock.com. Is, is that what it is? Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. So I think retailers are showing interest in it because of the, the, the market that it captures. Um, maybe more than the, the technology behind it. That's up for debate, I, I don't know. Um, I think with Silk Road, what was, what was interesting was that um, there were many layers through which the underlying cash that the uh, Silk Road users wanted to um, convert into Bitcoin to purchase uh, Ill illegal goods and services went through a, went through a few layers. Um, and if you, if you read the, the, Sh the Shrem complaint, um, at each layer, uh, this was passed through. Um, there was a, a, an alleged conspiracy to commit money laundering, which is the underlying issue that, that, that Shrem has now. Um, but the, the masking capability of, of using tumblers, which I, I'm not a tech guy, but um, uh, tumblers were, were used to um, disguise some of the originating um, IP addresses as well. Yeah. Um, and, and frankly, I think the, the conclusion that I saw from Silk Road was the phenomenal job that the U.S. government did from the technological side to unpick some of this. Oh, yeah. The, and it, it, it is <laughs> absolutely groundbreaking. But, but basically what Silk Road did is that they used this what's called TOR, um, onion routing system that was developed by the Navy, of course, to, to basically jitter everything up and make it impossible to, to trace the IP addresses. And I am as far from an IT person as one could possibly be. So, uh, so basically making it more difficult to conceal who the actual users were, who the, um, the merchants were, what was being bought, how it was being bought. And th they ended up with like a, a million registered users on slide three with $1.2 billion in revenue because they charged transaction fees in, in, in a short two year period. So we're talking about crazy amounts of users and crazy amounts of money. Uh, but then they would even layer it even more on slide four with these tumblers that, that, um, that Luke just mentioned to, to kind of even code it even more. And when I was a federal prosecutor specializing in the tax cases, we used to always say concealment shows knowledge that what you're doing is, is, is wrong. So you would say the fact that you layer things, the fact that you're trying to, to, to disguise the true nature of a transaction must mean that you know what you're doing is illegal or improper. Otherwise, you would just be out in the open and, and, and ha make your position well known. I think the mentality, especially in the wake of the NSA scandal, to some extent, has, it has to be changing a little bit, where, where now I think Americans don't necessarily trust government to to, to do right with the information they get, where maybe it's not the default that we should be out in the open doing, conducting our affairs or conducting our business. Maybe there actually is now some exception. You know, it's accepted to, to actually conceal a little bit and, and act in that way. Yeah, it's a really good point. I mean, the, if you overlay the two major issues that have happened in the last five or six years, which is the global financial crisis, and then the issues surrounding security and privacy with respect to the data that you have, Bitcoin overlays that. Bitcoin started 
and with very strong libertarian yeah, principles yeah. that are underlying it. There's a lot of libertarian right. investors out there that right. believe in it, which is which which was if you put a mirror up to the perception of some of the global financial crisis issues with respect to the traditional financial institutions, this was a great alternative. And then, then, this, uh, then when the NSA scandal and the issues, the subsequent dialogue around you know, what is private, what is secure, um, this then falls into that right new in. concept as well. So it, it actually came across, it's actually appeared at a, at a really interesting time as a mirror to put up against some of the, the, the broader social dialogue that the United States is going through right now. Yeah, I think conveniently when I was a prosecutor and I was arguing concealment, I think the jury would generally kind of see where I was coming from with yeah. why structure. I think today, when I have to make that argument as a defense lawyer, maybe for lucky with the timing, I guess, I think it's going to be a lot easier, better to resonate with the jury as to maybe this isn't automatically illicit just because it's in the underground, just because it's steps are being done to conceal. Um, but the, but the FBI, and I don't know if you know enough, anyone knows enough about the, the Silk Road story, how the FBI kind of jumped in and, and kind of blew it all open. Uh, I, I did some reading on it, uh, but, but someone knows it probably better than me. Go, go well, for I, it. Well, I think they, I think the, the um, I think it was the DEA <coughs> and the IRS. Yeah. Um, well, it's always the IRS when it's something yeah. good happens. Um, I think they use some traditional methods to understand the movement of money um, uh, and the illicit nature of the goods and services that were being provided. Um, and that formed the basis um, for some of their case. But when it came to actually tracing the money and tracing the identifier information behind the Silk Road users, that, um, that is still the secret source that I think um, mm -hmm. that, um, that the s s certain prosecuting bodies are, are, st are still feeling pretty pretty happy about and they're not giving that one away. But they're going to have to in discovery, I think, through this criminal case at some point. It's going to some forms of hacking. And yeah, they, they hacked in, right? right. Yeah. yeah, right. But how and what? I, I don't know. I yeah. don't know. They, they basically hacked in and were able yeah. to, to figure out the code and then they figured out who the users were and who the merchants were and next thing you know. Yeah. Uh, which, which strikes the very core concept of, of, of digital currency, which is the, the cryptographic element. The, the, the whole reason there's value in Bitcoin is because people believe in the cryptography. People believe in the secure nature of transferring that value across the internet. And that's based on, a crypt, on cryptography, the ability to encrypt, decrypt. And if, that, if that's not there, then you take away one of the foundational principles as to why people like it and why people want to use it and where the value is derived from. So it's quite an interesting concept there as well. Uh, on the last slide, we see that the FBI then, then after they cracked the code, they seized about 26,000 bitcoins that were worth 4 million bucks at the time of the slide, which watching the bitcoin market, who knows what that is today, whether... It, the FBI is the largest uh, holder of bitcoin. So. <laughs> 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 right. yeah. Yeah. That, that I have the number, I just don't have it with me. But. That bodes well for the future of bitcoin if the FBI is the one who yeah, controls the market. <laughs> and so this begs the question is, is it, we, we've looked at uh, whether Bitcoin should be regulated. We've, we've looked at ways in which the government is attempting to regulate. And we've now just seen how Bitcoin can be used as, as, the, uh, as the medium for the commission of criminal activity. Um, so I just posed the question to the panel in the Silk Road case, Bitcoin wasn't really the nefarious element in the criminal activity. It was, in fact, Silk Road, correct? Mm -hmm. All panels <laughs> nodding their head. Everyone agrees with me. Right. So, so that kind of circles us back once again, then, then how much regulation is appropriate by the government for... I think it gets to Nina's point that... that uh, I'm sorry, Margot's point that she made previously, which mm -hmm. was, um, you know, clearly um, Silk Road was was the marketplace that was doing everything from, uh, you know, drugs to child pornography to, uh, you know, a variety of other criminal activities. Um, but at the end of the day, um, you know, the, there was an interview with uh, the Dread uh, Pirate Roberts. Mm -hmm. um, Does everyone know the, the, why he's called the Dread Pirate Roberts? Because it's a good story. You like the story. Well, right? no, I guess it's named after the uh, Princess Bride, one right. of those, those cult movies that everyone loves, which apparently I think they're redoing, which 
is going to be awful <laughs> to see how we, <laughs> yeah, like, like how do you like recreate Andre the Giant in any role? But, but, but that's beside the point. So, so, so yeah. Well, and it, so look, he 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 said, and you know, I take him at his word. I mean, this this is what he said. I mean, he essentially said to paraphrase him, um, my choice is Bitcoin because it is the most anonymous currency out there, right? And right. and Bitcoin has allowed Silk Road to exist. So yeah. so I think it's a bit of, uh, you know, there there is a crossover. And again, I, I think one can, this goes back to Margot's point, that there are some elements of Bitcoin. Um, you know, it's anonymous in nature, the fact that you can sit in your living room in your pajamas and send money to China, um, that make it, um, that make it something that is attractive to the Silk Roads of the world. But they're, at the end of the day, they're, the government's going to have to prove the intent. They're going to have to prove that these individuals knew that the money was being used or the Bitcoins were being used to further criminal activity. And, and, and the concept, I guess, is going to kind of wrap back to this willful blindness or the ostrich type defense where, where, where you can't bury your head in the sand, ignore all facts around you and say, I didn't know what was going on. It, 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 and, and the government's going to have to try and piece together as best they can to show that, that the Silk Road operators very well knew that the, that the money was being used or the Bitcoins were being used for, for, for the criminal purpose. And I think, look, again, I think it goes back to the fundamental point that we made, which is that's no different a standard than if they and use cash or euros right. Right. or credit cards or Western Union. It's, it's exactly the same standard that they have to prove in the criminal case um, for any of this. And so, so again, it, it, again it, it doesn't fundamentally change the landscape. Um, prosecutors have the same burden that they've always had. Um, to establish criminal activity here. Right, because if it was cash, it would have the same anonymity mm -hmm. uh, that Bitcoin has. What about, let, let's flip over to, what about talking about anonymity? What about tax Im implications? And, and what about, you know, how does, how does the government look at payment of income tax or sales tax or, right? This is such a fascinating area also. Where's this going to go? Uh, filing of 1099s, W-2s, suppose you start, if I want to pay my employees in Bitcoin, then what? What do you think? Then you're working for the FBI, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I think that, that we see tax reporting generally is there to make the IRS's job, if they choose to, to audit you, easier. So, so they can then say, ah, you were supposed to file this 8300 when you dealt with the cash payment. Or here, you got the 1099 from the, from the third party who paid you X dollars. I, I think you're going to probably have to naturally see the, the regulations expand to include, and they probably actually, as they're written today, already include <coughs> Compensation, and it's so broadly worded in the income tax world that, that, that I think if you're getting compensated, whether it's a, a, a boat, a house, or a Bitcoin, and it's of value in exchange for work, the 1099 requirements, you're going to get the 1099. So I'm not sure if we need more laws or more rules. I just think it's going to be harder for the IRS to, to necessarily kind of keep track of this and hold people accountable when they choose to harass their taxpayer with the audit. I, I guess I, I, I think that, um, again, this is just the, the lawyering that goes on, right? And what bucket does it fall in? Is it property? You know, is it not property? Right. Is it compensation? What does it mean? Right. And so while the laws may cover it, there has to be some interpretation and the regulators need to step out or step back one way or the other. But at the end of the day, from a tax perspective, well, the compensation is compensation, and, and, and I'm not sure the bottom line is going to matter. But I, I agree. Not, that the, yeah, yeah, I'm not arguing with you, other than to say, from their, from the IRS's perspective, they're confused. Well, that's normal. <laughs> but, 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 but as to yeah. where to where to place it, how to treat it. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but I think I think the issue of anonymity is particularly highlighted here because, frankly, how's the IRS going to know? when someone is paid in Bitcoin and they haven't filed their 1099 or how, how, how is that going to be traced? I think the way they trace unreported income today in, in, in a, any other type of case, they're going to do a net worth analysis, they're going to right. look at the expenditures and the money that's spent, they're going to look at the, 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 the kind of the, the way that someone's living their life and doesn't match up with their uh, tax return. My, my last case I prosecuted when I was with the government was this father and son hotel developers, they had the uh, 
like $20 million house on South Beach. They had the helicopter that they took to work each day because the traffic over 195 was so bad. They had the limo driver. They had, you name it, they had it, and they reported $30,000 a year on their tax returns. And, and that was a pretty easy sale. That's obviously a very black and white example. But I think that they're going to still look at, they still have, I guess my position would be, we don't need more laws. We don't need really more regulations. What we have is on the books. Let, let's just enforce what's on the books. I think one um, other point on that is the valuation of it, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say you right. want to tax it, is how do you value it? <clears throat> the Federal Election Committee took um, yeah. bitcoins as a in-kind contribution instead of money. And cause again, by definition, they weren't sure how to define it, so they said it was an in-kind contribution. And then the question was, well, how do, we, how do we value it if it's so volatile and changing? Yeah. And they decided to value it on the day that it came in. That was the value of the in-kind contribution. Mm -hmm. So for tax purposes, it would be similarly, Same, yeah. you know, di well, easy Argument. and hard. Right. Right. I, so, I, I still believe there's a, there's a but, but fundamental um, discussion going on around asset classification in general. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and that, although the industry is developing at quite some pace, you're seeing, um, and as you see, potentially more mainstream activity with respect to retailers using it. Um, they, I, I don't believe there's been any definitive issue with res guidance with respect to asset classification, whether it's a, whether it is actually a currency, whether it is a commodity, uh, whether it's a security, a marketable security or capital asset, and you you find examples out there where um, where it could be either of those things, many of those things. And if you look at the Winklevoss, who are the, the famous mm -hmm. Facebook twins, I mean, they, in their S1 filings, the, I mean, that they classify as a capital asset in, in an exchange trade fund. And they do that for a variety of reasons. They don't want to be an exchanger, so the underlying security is the Bitcoin. Um, but they're classifying it as something completely different. So it's, it's, it's being talked about like a currency, and it's being traded like a commodity. And it has to be one or the other, because frankly, you can't have you can't be a store of value and a medium of exchange at the same time. It, and 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 until the asset classification issue is is um, is clearer, the tax the underlying tax taxation of it, and and the difficulties that you've mentioned about you know the time of valuation and, and, and traditional taxation issues. I mean, that's a fundamental. Again, it's coming back to some serious fundamentals that no one is that there is still. A, a debate about, and uh, and it's causing, you know, splits in the community, sp splits in the industry, you know, and um, um, and people's definitions um, will guide it down particular paths. So uh, yeah, so uh, it's it's a, it's a fascinating, but a conceptual level, it's very interesting, but also it's it's proving complicated in real life as well. Mm -hmm. um, just a, a spin-off from what you were just saying, Luke. You know, being that. That the uh, the government is is looking at ways to regulate, and um, there seems to be a, a consensus among government that there needs to be regulation to protect the consumer. Essentially, mm -hmm. um, do you think, Luke, that much as we've seen in the area of uh, FCPA enforcement, there's been a, a greater need for monitors and more corporate compliance? And, and do you think? Now going forward with Bitcoin brokers, uh, much like uh, Bit Instant, mm -hmm. there will be, which was the Shrem company, and by the way, he was supposed to be the monitor, Shrem. So that's sort of humorous. Um, do you think there'll be a greater need or a market for uh, monitors for the Bitcoin brokers? I, I, I firmly believe that, yeah. Uh -huh. I, I, I just don't think anybody's got there yet in a meaningful way. Right. Um, you have many, potentially many layers of brokers who will take a fee for passing it and, and moving it on. Uh, but the, there are still only know, maybe half a dozen exchanges in the world. Some of them aren't in the US. Um, and so um, it, 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 if you look at the, the way the pr everything works, it, there is, it's still very fragile. It's, it comes down to a very small number of exchanges. That actually will move, that will exchange that Bitcoin for fiat currency and vice versa. When it comes to regulatory compliance, um, uh, like most regulation, um, 
there will be increased compliance at many, le many levels. And, and the way the technology will develop and the way people insert themselves in the industry will guide um, where a lot of the regulatory compliance comes from. So um, we're talking about exchanges, but what about brokers um, in the future? Um, and I think that we, that this, the issue of regulatory compliance around exchanges is still not there. I think it's posing uh, an interesting question to commerce as to how you monitor um, anonymous digital movements um, such that they meet the, the high standards of um, traditional money services businesses. Um, I don't think anybody's quite got there yet. Uh, and I think the, I think it's the, the, the burden is on, um, on business and the private mm -hmm. sector to, to figure out that. Um, you know, because the regulators have, they've, they've marked where the standard is. And as I came back to before, it's, it's up to business and the private sector to meet that standard. Did you want to say something, Frederick? I just think you know we, we sort of talk about um, all these issues and I, and I think they're they're fascinating issues. I mean, just from a from a discussion standpoint, I think there's just a, a ton of very interesting issues here. Um, and I think you know our again, I mean, we we exist in the anti money laundering space and counter terrorist financing, so that's our niche of the world. And um, you know our regulations, I think again, you know we deal across a lot of sectors: securities, commodities. Banking, MSBs, gold and gem dealers, you know, so um, by its nature, our regulations are flexible enough, I think, to accommodate a, a, a wide variety of different industries. And so I think your point is to what is this? Um, I, I, I do think that's still a bit of an open question. And I think one of the nice things, again, about our regulations is, is they are flexible to accommodate for that. If at some point this is determined to be a commodity, which won't be our decision. Yeah. Um, if, but, if at some point this is determined to be a commodity, there are AML regulations that govern that, right? Um, to the extent it's securitized, there's AML regulations for that. So, um, so the nice thing is it's flexible, but I also think, you know, again, from a good governance perspective, um, I don't know that you want any government, let alone the U.S. government, rushing in and making very um, quick determinations about every facet of what is an evolving marketplace, um, I do think there's some merit to um, working with the marketplace. I mean, look, we've, we've, hosted, uh, we've hosted virtual currency folks and who have, um, you know, come and talk to us and we've talked to law enforcement and we talked to a lot of different people. Um, that's one of the unique things about FinCEN is that we, we sort of are at the crossroads of regulators, industry, um, our foreign counterparts, and law enforcement. And so we do sit at that crossroads and we make an effort to really talk to everyone and to try to get viewpoints from industry, to try to get viewpoints from regulators, et cetera. And, and I think that's valuable. And I think you'll see, uh, we just had two, uh, two rulings that came out and were published fairly recently. Again, clarifying, you know, do these, do these rules apply or not? And in both cases, they did not. And, and I think that's an important distinction, and at least from the press that I saw from that, um, it seemed to be well received. There was a sense of, this is how the system should work. That where there's questions, um, you know, the public asks the government, and the government responds and clarifies what the rules of the road are. So, in many ways, I think it's working how it should. And I think there's still a lot of unknowns, but I think that's expected in an area that's evolving as quickly as it, as it is. The, the I'm from Washington, I'm here to help, uh, is, is always taken with a, a, a bit of skepticism. <laughs> but, but, but I do think we do need that clarity, because with that flexibility comes ambiguity, and with ambiguity comes confusion, and when there's confusion, we, you see the government maybe moving in one direction with an enforcement action that they don't move in another direction, and then you end up with people who, who, who are kind of caught in no man's land wondering, what do I do, and then you're paralyzed, and, 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 and nothing gets done, and, and, and the industry is shut down, and sometimes I, I'm cynical enough to think that that's the government's intent, is, 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 to, is to be so slow sometimes to react that it creates such confusion that it kind of just hopefully goes away and doesn't become a problem. Uh, it's hard having, so, having worn that hat for nine years and now so I've switched the other side. <laughs> so, I, and look, I, I think there's always, there's always a desire for clarity, which I think is important. Um, but as the government, you also, I mean, as you know, you have to be cautious of unintended consequences. Of course. Um, and, and you have to be cautious that what you're doing is, is well thought and that you've 
put the right amount of thought and discussion into it um, to ensure that you don't take an action which will have an unintended consequence on an industry. And so we're, we're very cautious and think through these issues very carefully um, to try to make sure that each decision that we make and each guidance that we put out and each statement, frankly, that we make about it. Because if, if I or the director of FinCEN go up and talk about something, um, I, I guarantee it ends up um, in some article the next day. And so um, I do think you have to be very measured as the government about your approach to these things so that you don't inadvertently cause um, a harm or an effect that, that you certainly didn't intend. No, and there are examples in, in other aspects of government, specifically with the IRS, where you can ask for a private letter ruling, where you lay out your facts. Here, here, here is what we did, what is the tax consequences? And the fact that you have that ability to go back and forth, I just think that the government then is going to kind of come back and say to those who didn't take advantage of that process, yeah. and say, you should have, and now that you didn't, we're going to hold you accountable, and here's your fine, go directly to jail. Mm. And, and, and I don't know how much... I don't know how much um, uh, let's call it the industry, um, and that whether that's you know, Bitcoin or digital currency advocates, whether that's traditional finance institutions considering it, uh, or venture capital money or, or, or large retails. I don't know how much, what level of interaction they are having with government in order to, in order to help guide and define what is acceptable. Um, I don't have any insight into that, but, but if, if there is an increased level of dialogue, then that can only be a good thing for uh, for that relationship and the professionalization of the industry in general. Well, you would know the, more about Yeah, I was just going to mention the, yeah. the New York um, Department of Financial Services hearing. It was last week or the week before. They had two days of hearings and heard from um, industry, investors, lawyers, and, and so on. And I, I think the message was um, want for regulation, want for MSB, Bitcoin license, some type of state money transmitter license, um, knowing that the AML aspects are already there. Mm -hmm. But um, so I think people galvanized around where, where is there a place that I can go to legitimize what I'm doing mm -hmm. for the good actors? Uh, there was a lot of discussion about a lighter touch uh, on the regulatory regime. Well, first, unanswered questions, you know, how do you you know, if you're going to get a money transmitter license, how do you um, meet bonding requirements? Again, all about valuation. Um, lots of sort of very particulars about money licensing, which we don't need to talk about, but basically porting over this new concept onto to old laws. Um, I think that the bottom line was they thought, yeah, they, they wanted to be licensed um, in, in some way. They thought it would be good for the industry, but wanted a lighter touch, and the regulators' approach where well, was, well, you know, I'm not sure how much lighter we can go. The, a lot of discussion about, well, let us operate for a year and see if we can stay in business, and then we'll get a license. And that, <laughs> that, that really wasn't the right balance I think New York was, was seeking. Um, but the dialogue's happening, I guess, this is the bottom line. In, in I found it interesting, and I say this just as a, as a consumer and not as government employee, but I found that to be interesting because there did seem to be a sense that consumers, um, you know, that, that to a certain degree, regulation is good because consumers want to deal with well-run organizations. I mean, they want to know if I go to an exchanger, um, they're much more comfortable going to an exchanger who is, you know, licensed with FinCEN and is compliant with regulations and has a good reputation because they know that if, if I send my Bitcoin there and I ask for money back, I'm actually going to get money back. Right. And, um, I, I, and, and, and so I think to a certain degree, I mean, we talk about the burden of regulation, but I also think for consumers, mm -hmm. um, and, and again, I say this as a consumer and not as a government employee, but I think as a consumer, to a certain degree, where you have um, a business that has, that has worked to be legitimate, it mm -hmm. has worked yep. to meet regulations and has worked to put in place um, those systems necessary to, to meet the regulation. I mean, I think there's a certain confidence that as a consumer you have in that entity that you would not necessarily have to another entity. So in some ways, as, as contrary as it may be, um, you know, I guess initially think about it, I think that complying with some of this regulation actually, I think could be thought of as being good business mm -hmm. um, because I think you may have a competitive advantage as being sort of the trusted person. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I think, and that um, is only underscored by the fact that 
there were uh, at least two, if not more, major thefts of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Major thefts. Good. Do right. you know the numbers on that? They, they're big numbers. Yeah, no, they, they were in the millions. Yeah. Um, and so, so I think, again, I, I think that goes to the, to the question that as a consumer, um, you know, do you want to use the business that is reputable and is meeting statutory and regulatory requirements, or do you want to go with the business that isn't? But, think, but don't you think the market is going to dictate that as well, that if somebody kind of steps up and says, I'm the... Bank of America of Bitcoin or whatever you want to be, and, and starts acting there in a prudent manner, and does their uh, th th they're gonna kind of seize the market if that's what those who use this currency want to do. So so I'm so that, yeah. that's the classic government, big government versus small government, I guess, debate. That, that, that. You know, I I think that a consumer will have a choice as to whether they want to use a dollar or a Bitcoin, and and part of that decision making process is how much trust they have in the ability for Bitcoin to, de to deliver on what it says it's supposed to. Um, and what protection those consumers have um, should, uh, should something go wrong in the transaction process. And uh, if you look at it in those terms, the fact that the, the, the Bitcoin transaction is irreversible, okay. that there is no consumer protection right now, um, it, it, it still perhaps uh, remains uh, um, the consumers would would perhaps have more faith and more trust in a dollar than a Bitcoin on a general level right now. I'm, I'm guessing I haven't done a consumer survey on that. Um, but, you know, it comes back down to the, the value proposition of what Bitcoin is supposed to do. And, and mainstream acceptance will occur if consumers believe that they, they have as much faith and trust in the use of a Bitcoin as they do in a dollar. And that's the discrepancy you have because the trust in a dollar is because the US government back it. It's because the, tr the, the transaction systems that, that have been governing in the last 30, 40 years mean that you, you can get your money back if there's a wrong transaction. That doesn't occur in Bitcoin. Well, same thing with cash though, just to say, right. right, to devil's advocate, right? Sure. You, you lose your wallet. Right? Yeah. Whether it's your Bitcoin wallet or your leather wallet, you leave it somewhere or someone pickpockets you, comes in and hacks it. I mean, there's no, you know, there's no FDIC insurance for cash. For, there's for, or yeah, there's no. Yeah. Right? Oh, you're so cynical. Right. I just know they're going to find my wallet and call me and give me back every, every day. <laughs> but, 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 but not to change the subject, but I think another issue that maybe we're, we're, we're talking about is, is when you have these, this business kind of pushed outside the United States, how do you enforce, how is the government going to enforce in this global flat world the, 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 these currencies that, that are crossing the borders? And, and, and I, I know from my offshore tax experience where we were looking at some sort of U.S. nexus, unfortunately or fortunately, however you want to look at it, the, the long arm of U.S. jurisdiction is, is pretty darn long. It, does, it doesn't take much to, to trigger uh, U.S. Regula regulatory, I guess, requirements to, to comply. So, so I, I think it's kind of going to be an interesting issue to see as this stuff kind of gets, if the government is overreacts and it gets pushed more and more into the shadows how, outside the United States, how is the U.S. government going to react in, to, to try and bring it either into compliance at all or are we basically just going to be stuck with a, a world where it's completely in the underground? I and mean, that's, I guess, the big question at the end all of the right. day. Right? Frederick, do you feel that you have the tools that you need? So, so I think, um, look, you know, we, we have existing tools, and I think you know we've, we have used them and are prepared to do so. Um, and uh, you know, I, I think the question of, of what what comes in the future, I, I think, is always an open question. But I think right now we're we're looking at, at what tools and authorities we have, and we're using them like we do in any other industry. And I think um, so. So I think at the end of the day, um, again, I think you've got much the same concerns with. Uh, you know, what if Bitcoin moves offshore? But we have money exchangers who move offshore. We have banks that are offshore. I mean, there's, so again, I think, again, the, you know, if you look at the, the threats, it's, to some degree, they are analogous, and there's going to be differences because of technology, but it, to some degree, um, we're already answering and dealing with those questions. Um, so I think this just falls into the, to the same lane, that, that we have to deal with those threat actors already who use offshore systems, and this is just one more example where that could potentially happen. All right, so in regulating Bitcoin, 
FinCEN believes that they've got the tools available to do what needs to be done. Because they interpret the law if you sneeze and it's somehow, not, not you, but the U.S. government basically says you sneeze and it impacts commerce here in the United States, you're now subject to our regulations. We see it in the Foreign Corrupt Practice Act um, legislation. We see it in the, in, in the tax world now where, where they're going after folks who've never stepped in U.S. soil, who never made phone calls to the U.S. and accusing them of helping Americans conceal assets and charging them with crimes where they never violated their own countries. So, so I guess that's got to be another counterbalance here. You just got to, there's concern about how far was the U.S. government going to try to reach and, and continue to reach. Right. And, I, and I think we're still, the, the clear, I still think we're lacking clarity as to how to specifically <laughs> define Bitcoin. Right, Margo? Mm -hmm. So, you know, whether it's property, whether it's barter, whether it's a foreign currency, whether it's a financial instrument, those are, well, FinCEN has taken a position as to what it is. I don't know that that's a global position. Right. Right. So those issues are still issues that we'll be working through, and regrettably, although I thought we were going to accomplish it today, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> um, it doesn't seem to have happened. Um, the enforcement mechanisms we've taken a look at, we've looked at the use of the Patriot Act. Let, let me just divert to that for a second, because I do want to kind of wrap things up in sort of some sort of cohesive package. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the use of the Patriot Act, you know, the Patriot Act is one of those things that you kind of pull out of your back pocket in an emergency, in, in my opinion. Um, maybe not so much. Is, is the Patriot Act a, uh, a tool used frequently by, by um, you know, FinCEN or the SEC or? So, so I think it depends how you define the Patriot Act because there's, there's, ah. there's a huge amount of things in the Patriot Act. Yeah, there Act, is. Right? This is true. So, um, so I mean, it actually it crosses a lot of different branches of government. Um, so, you know, I, I think the Patriot Act gets a lot of use just because it's a law like any other in the United States that um, amended statutory provisions across the U.S. Code. So, um, so when you talk about the Patriot Act, it's tough, I think, to generalize. Well, I was talking about with respect to in, Liberty in Reserve. Though. Specifically as to our 311 power. Right. Um, we, um, look, I think we use it appropriately and where needed. Um, and I think, you know, we obviously can't talk hypothetically about where we will use in the future. We may not use it, we may, we may use it. It really, again, it's, it's much like a criminal case. It's tough to generalize because, you know, each is a really a case-by-case -case determination and we use it where we think that we have identified a primary money laundering concern and where use of 311 is appropriate. And there's a number of statutory enumerated factors that, that we consider. Um, and it's a very deliberative process. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, certainly, you know, like, like any authority, where it's appropriate to use it, we'll use it. Um, and where it isn't, we won't. Um, but, um, but I think, you know, if you look at Liberty Reserve, I think that's, that's a great example of where um, our Section 311 power was appropriately used um, to stop what was, in essence, a payment system that was designed specifically um, to facilitate criminal activity. Comments from the panel on that? On any, any other in, uh, enforcement mechanisms, I, I would like the audience to, to have the general understanding of the enforcement mechanisms used with respect to. Well, I, I think you're seeing traditional asset forfeiture uh, tools used also by by the government, where they're coming in, they're saying we can tie this to criminal activity. We're, we're taking it. We're, we're taking it. Right. Um, we're we're going to take your bank account. We're going to take your car. We're going to take your transmitters. We're going to take your computers. We're going to take whatever we can trace to the criminal activity, which comes back to the, the, the bigger picture of the, these are laws that are on the books, and as long as they're able to show the criminal nexus, they can sue it, to, sue to take the property, or they can criminally uh, right. indict and, and, and seize. Right, and which is not, not unique to Bitcoin at all. Right. And if you're not licensed as a money transmitter, right. Yeah, which is... Which is a regulatory issue, right? right. And which is an issue. Right, and, and again, I think it's an issue that much as if you're taking, um, you know, you're taking cash and sending it to, you know, pick your favorite country, um, you're sending it to France, um, and you're not <laughs> licensed to do so, or mm -hmm. you're accepting Bitcoin and sending it to France. Mm -hmm. I, again, it's... It, it's it's exactly the same in whether it's a regulatory response or whether it's a criminal response. Really depends on the specific facts of the case. And I don't speak for the Department of Justice anymore, so 
I'll, I'll let them speak as to where they think 1960 is appropriately right. used in a criminal sense. Um, but obviously, there's a difference between a regulatory response um, and and a criminal case under under 1960. And and I think you you know you just you can look at press releases in and of themselves to see that not every regulatory case results in a criminal case, and not every criminal case has a right. regulatory right. response. Yeah, you hope they use the criminal process for the egregious, really blatantly bad cases. <laughs> the criminal ones. The criminal ones. <laughs> Not the football. <laughs> Does um, anyone have any questions? We've got a couple of minutes. Yep. Um, hi, my name is Patrick Soon. I'm uh, a young attorney in Newport Beach, in Montana, California. Uh, I'm a Bitcoin enthusiast. I invested early on. I like uh, talking about it with friends. Are you an FBI agent? No. I'm not. <laughs> He's <laughs> fine. Like. Uh, in fact, one of my friends uh, started a job board. Um, he calls it CoinAlley.com, and his company is not evaluated to be about 1.8 million dollars, uh, U.S. dollars. So it's, he really got in early with this. Um, one thing that I, I really want to say, uh, I appreciate all of you coming today and talking about this. This is a really interesting topic for me. Um, one question that I have is, you know, what are the origins of Bitcoin? It seems like we talked about enforcement today, um, going after criminals, Silk Road, um, encryption. But one thing that we know for sure is that Bitcoin was founded on encryption called 256-bit which was developed by the NSA. Um, I'm really curious, you know, if one day it does come out who the inventor of Bitcoin is, um, if that has any effect on your jobs in the various agencies you work in, or if that has any sort of uh, informative effect on the way the public uses Bitcoin. Hmm. I, I think the anonymity of the founder has, has created a certain hype. Oh, I frankly don't think it's gigantically relevant, um, I, but um, I, I, but by the same token, if um, if you don't know who the founder of a of a particular issue or a, or a company is, then that that in itself um, could be deemed to be a red flag. Um, I th I think that the I, I'm guessing that the strong libertarian principles which underlie the Bitcoin and the the work and the blockchain. Um, I, I think the founder let it speak for itself. That's my opinion. I have no basis for that other than just having read read a bit. So um, I, I, I think it attracts some people. I think it. I think, frankly, it puts other a lot of other people off. Um, um, but I, I think it was a deliberate. It was obviously deliberately. It was an intentional. Uh, effort on the part of the founder to remain probably in the background. That said, there are there is a core team of five developers which which monitor and update the protocol, and those names are you, know, you can just Google those names. So those are people that look after it, and they're paid by the Bitcoin Foundation. So there's a there is a structure behind it. And I don't know whether I, I guess I agree with you. I think I, I, to your point, I think it attracts some people and it pushes some people away from a reputational perspective. you know, a technological protocol that someone decided had value because of its limited nature. But that almost same technology is utilized now to tamper seal certain financial assets, negotiable instruments that are created electronically so you can detect alteration. I mean, it's so I'm not sure if it's much different than that, other than the kind of, ooh, who created this? And that it's finite and it's um, used by the criminal market that's really made it move. I think also, you know, there are, I think last count, maybe I'm wrong, I'm behind, maybe there, there were 36 other versions. 36 other coins out there. Yeah, Litecoin. Litecoin, uh, Kanye coin, Kanye which West is now or no like longer. Um, so there are iterations, right? And um, uh, and if you, the pace of the technological development, it will continue to iterate at an extraordinarily fast rate and already has with the introduction of colored coins. And so, um, so yes, it's, yes, it's a point. I think it becomes less relevant from a technological standpoint as the as the technology iterates, um, and 
but you know, in terms of the broader point about transparency, I think transparency is an extremely important point, um, which validates the entire concept. So you know, I think, I think, um, I think there there is a need for transparency um, for it to maintain its its relevance. Comments? You know, uh, did you want to comment on that? No. Um, we can take one more question, and then we're going to have to roll. So please. Um, and, and you noticed Jeffrey said at the outset that he hadn't accepted Bitcoin from any clients yet. What, what if someone walked into your office and said, "I want to pay in Bitcoin," um, what, or how would you advise some other? What, what would you say to some other criminal defense attorney? Yeah, 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 take it. yeah no, yeah. yeah. How, how much are we talking about? No, look, I don't. Why don't you just say yes? Yes. <laughs> no, but, but but I guess the question though is, do I have to file an eighty three hundred? Right. That's uh, the question. Uh, like, what 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 regulations am I now going to subject myself to if I if I take it? Converting um, immediately. Con con like yeah, con converting yeah. So, so, so th that's where my hesitation would be, just the unknown as to what else. If someone walks in with a suitcase of cash, I generally tell them go to the banker and and, and deposit it and then write me a check because that way I can rely upon the the bank's internal anti-money laundering to, to, to raise whatever suspicion. I'm going to ask my questions as to where the money is coming from, uh, for sure. But, but I think that's part of the concern with the Bitcoin is, as a criminal defense lawyer, I want to make sure that I can get paid and I can keep the money that I'm paid to do my job. So I need to ask, where is it coming from? Is this legal money? Is it clean money? And, and then I want to make sure I can keep it. And then if there's forms that need to be filed, i got to follow the, the, <laughs> the darn forms just like anybody else. Right. So that's... That's where the confusion, I guess, comes into play. Right, but that also circles back to perhaps a, a, and most likely a greater role for corporate compli for compliance and monitors. Um, we are out of time. I'm, please join me in thanking the panel.